Okay, we are live. Let me just do a quick check here. All is good. Let's see how we're doing on Rockfin here. Let me collect, connect it to Rockfin. All right. Fantastic. Welcome, everybody, to a Thursday live stream. I have with me Alexander Mercurius in London, the Oracle of London. And we have a very special and distinguished guest joining us for the first time is Dr. Wilmer Leon. He is a best-selling author, political commentator, and Dr. Wilmer Leon. I will call you Wilmer as we talk before the show. So Please do. Um, Wilmer, uh, I have all your information in the description box down below, your website, your books, where people can find you. After the show, I will add it as a pinned comment as well. But you are also the host of uh, two very successful, very popular uh, radio shows, one of which you were telling me has a huge reach as well. Would you like to uh, tell everybody how they can listen to you on radio? Well, Monday through Fridays on uh, Radio Sputnik in the United States, 105.5 FM. And then you can go to SputnikNews.com and catch us uh, anywhere in the world between uh, 6 and 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And on Saturdays from 11 to 2 Eastern, I am on Sirius XM 126 Urban View. Fantastic. So with that being said... Hello to everybody that is watching us on YouTube, on Rockfin, on Odyssey, on Rumble, and hello to our amazing Duran community, the Duran.locals.com. Hello to our moderators as well who are helping us out on this uh, show. We have with us the one and only, the great Zariel. Zariel, how are you doing? And we have the fantastic reckless abandon as well moderating and of course of course alan watson hmm. the one and only alan watson helping out with the moderation as well so let's get started alexander hmm. in london i pass it off to you let's begin can, can i just before i start say that i've been a guest i've been hosted by wilmer on both of his radio shows they are absolutely wonderful i strongly urge people to go and um, they are a delight also to appear on. And it's a joy to have Wilma with us here on this uh, on this show. Well, I today I, our, our talk is about the great duel between the great powers. Putin made a very interesting speech at the Valdai conference a short time ago. He spoke about a period of transition. He said it would last about 10 years between the remnants, the disintegrating but still dangerous remnants of the uni unipolar system, the hegemonic system of the West. He said that we have to get through these 10 years, that what we will get through to at the other end will be a multipolar system, uh, one of many power centers, each trying to find a balance and a position with the others but that these 10 years are going to be extremely difficult. And I have to say, when I was reading Putin's comments, I did wonder whether perhaps he's been listening to Wilmer's lectures, <laughs> because essentially that is the point that Wilmer has been making for some time. So um, let's go over to Wilmer. Wilmer, I mean, is this what Putin said? I mean, obviously I said he's been listening to you, but perhaps you can enlarge and elaborate on this because it seems to me that that is exactly the uh, direction that we're going in. And every crisis that we have, Ukraine, Iran, which is now sort of seething up, Taiwan, they all have to be understood within this framework. This is my own personal view. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Let me say that my co-host Garland Nixon and I on the uh, Critical Hour show on, on Sputnik, we've been talking about this for, my goodness, it seems like years now. And, you know, what I think, the, the, I guess kind of the predicate that, I, that I'd like to lay is all empires run their course. And whether we look at the, the, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire from a European context, uh, they, they, all, they all run their course. And it, 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 the United States 
uh, hates to consider itself an empire. It, it always sees itself as a republic. But when you when you look at uh, the territories that not only the United States holds around the world, but when you look at the territories where the United States has has bases established around the world, the United States, both from from a military perspective as well as from an economic perspective, has has been an empire. Some would say since the end of World War One, we can say the end of World War Two, uh, and 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 so. Uh, I think President Putin and President Xi gave similar speeches. Mm-hmm. Uh, President Xi's speech at the end of the um, at the fifth uh, summit, the communist summit that they had in China. Uh, yes, the 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 unipolar uh, hegemonic dominance of the United States is coming to an end, and with the technology that we have at our disposal, we are able now to see it happening in real time. And I think that's one of the things that is surprising so many people that shows like this uh, shows like the one I host with Garland and mine on XM. We talk about these things as they're happening, as opposed to uh, the delays that one would have in the past with newspapers and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think president Putin is absolutely right. I'm surprised that he put a 10 year period on it, but, but, He's a pretty smart guy. He's read a few a few history books. And so I think mm. he tends to see the cycle as the cycle is. Absolutely. Now, I mean, the last time that we had a period of imperial decline, an empire in decline, it was Britain. And I mean, I'm at I I live in London. I've lived in London all my adult life. And of course, I'm here at the old imperial capital. And I'm going to say straight away that the great period of danger in any international system is when the overarching empire declines, when it starts to lose control. And a lot depends on what the leaders of that empire do, whether they understand that their empire is in decline and try and manage that decline in a way that preserves the international system, or whether alternatively they go for broke and they try to preserve their position by creating conflicts which they think they can win. And one view which I have heard from very esteemed British historians, it was first articulated to me by A.J.P. Taylor, by the way, I say to me, I mean, there was a huge hall, it was a lecture, is that the First and Second World Wars, that period of world crisis at the beginning of the 20th century, was a product of British imperial decline, and that the, the cause, the disruptive cause, ultimately, was Britain's attempts to sustain its system. In other words, they weren't accepting the fact that their empire was in decline. And he referred to the First and Second World Wars as the wars of the British succession. In other words, that there was this enormous breakdown in the international system because the British really would, weren't prepared at the beginning of the 20th century to accept that they were going to lose their hegemonic position. What is the United States going to do? Are, is the United States going to repeat the pattern of Britain? Are they going to intensify their attempts to try and cling on? Or are they going to accept that they are in a period when they're receding, that their power is ebbing, that they can't keep the system as it was are they what are your views well i mean i asked the question um i think i know the answer but perhaps it will give you a chance to um articulate your views well i think the united states the elite do realize that the empire is in decline they are unfortunately reverting to the tactics that failing empires revert to. It doesn't appear to me as though the Tony Blinkens of the world and the and the 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 Clintons of the world and the Bidens of the world that they've really learned any lessons from history. I mean, just yesterday, you or early today, it, it was reported that the United States is considering training troop twenty five hundred troops a month. I think. Uh, Ukrainian troops in Germany. The United States is looking, is listening to Boeing um, uh, as Boeing now wants to send missiles into uh, uh, 
into Ukraine. So they're escalating the conflict. You've got uh, Mike McCarthy, the incoming leader of the Republicans in the in the in the U.S. House, talking about sending another delegation to Taiwan after the failed uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, misadventure. So it seems as though in so many instances, the United States is fanning the flames of conflict and they're fanning the flames of conflict against powers that will not be defeated, uh, particularly as the United States is trying to fight these powers in their own backyards. That 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 just so uh, and and not to mention what's happening in the global south with the number of elections that we've seen in Venezuela, in Colombia, in 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 Brazil, uh, uh, they're all throwing out the 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 previous established neoliberal governments that were backed by the United States, and we're looking at what the United States is trying to do in Haiti. They want to send a military intervention into Haiti. That's not going to work. So they don't seem to have learned their lessons of history. They do seem to be repeating the failed responses from uh, from, pre from previous empires. And again, because of, of technology, we're going to watch this whole thing play out right before our very eyes. Absolutely. Can I just say, I'm glad you mentioned Taiwan, because, of course, we've had local elections in Taiwan. And you use the word fanning crisis, because... It's quite clear to me from these local elections that just as was the case in Ukraine, people in Taiwan don't want this. They want to be left alone. They've got problems. They've got issues with China, some of them. But they probably feel, you know, let's just be left alone and we can sort it out ourselves. But the United States trundles on. It wants to send more arms to Taiwan. It wants to send more arms to Ukraine. It wants to do all of these things. It's keeping these crises going all the time. And of course, as you said it now, is talking about intervening in Haiti and even the Guardian, which has you know, uh, become entirely pro-American, is now reporting that people in Haiti do not want this intervention forced on them. They've had lots of American interventions and everyone has been a failure. And yet we see the cycle, not just of, of intervention, not just continuing, it's intensifying. We see an almost frenetic need now to find things to interfere with. Haiti uh, being just one. There's talk now about, you know, exercises to attack Iran. I mean, it seems like almost a kind of loss of control at the imperial center you sort of striking out in all directions are there any countervailing vo voices in the united states is the are people in the political class is anybody in the political class saying enough of this we can't continue like this well unfortunately those voices are few and far between mm -hmm. and there you know you do have uh for example uh uh, the Black Agenda Report. You've got Margaret Kimberly. You've got you've got uh, uh, a number of progressive voices and forces, but we really don't hear too many uh, political voices in opposition. You know, the, the the stereotype in the United States has always, well, for the last fifty years or so, has or sixty years, has been that the Democrats are the party of peace and the Republicans are the party of war. But now we have a, 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 a Democrat president, House and Senate. They're passing the National Defense Authorization Act, sending billions and billions and billions of dollars over to Ukraine. It's Democrats that are now fanning the flames of conflict, funding with uh, American tax dollars uh, the, these conflicts. Con in contrary to the stereotype that uh, that you know during the Vietnam era that that people tended to see, and so no, we really don't have uh, Bernie Sanders' voices is is muted, unfortunately, and and so we, we really don't have uh, those voices, and to a great degree, what you see in the media, the media's response is, oh, if you're challenging the, the, 
the jingoistic war effort, then you must be a Putin bot. You must be a robot. You must be controlled by the Kremlin or you love China. I mean, all of these kinds of attacks simply because we don't want our tax dollars wasted on on foolish errands so that what is it the ceo of boeing is it george calhoun i think who said back in 2020 during the election boeing doesn't really care who wins the election because no matter who's in power boeing is still going to get their funding and what do we find in the story about the missiles being sent or biden considering sending new more missiles into ukraine it's at boeing's request or Boeing's proposal that this be done. So it all centers around really has nothing to do with diplomacy. It has everything to do with the military industrial complex complex or the, or the Mickey Matt as, um, uh, as others like to call it. Absolutely. Because I mean, this is one of the things that's happened is that there is now for, uh, Within the United States, a very powerful group of people, a very rich group of people, who are the beneficiaries of empire. If you live in London, you see the you know the sites all over London of the same sort of class of people that they used to be with the British Empire. And those people are not going to give up the benefits of empire easily, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even though, uh, um, you know, it, benefits of empire, again, as you know, if, if you lived here in Britain, are very unequally distributed. But the class that has those benefits controls the levers. And they control the levers in ways that in Britain, but even more perhaps in the United States now, are distorting the effects of the political system. And you have to wonder, I mean, do the elites have to have everything? I mean, it's 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 as though they, they don't they don't even really understand. They don't now they don't even want to give the appearance of equity. They don't even want to try to fool people into thinking that the interests of the poor and the working class and the middle class are actually being considered. You know, it, it's amazing to me. Uh, listening to the rhetoric and to the to the campaign rhetoric from Joe Biden during 2020, he knew exactly what to say. So it's not as though uh, the 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 elite don't know what's going on, because Joe Biden knew to talk about free college, which most other countries industrialized and, and developed countries have, except the United States. He talked about free junior college. He talked about health care. He talked about a minimum wage. He talked about, he pushed the buttons. He knew exactly what to say, but now we look at this looming rail strike in the United States. In September, Joe Biden said he wanted to be the most pro-labor president in the history of the United States. Now labor needs the backing of the White House so that they can get seven days of sick leave. And all of a sudden, he turns a deaf ear to the the reality of labor. So my point in all of that is they know what to say when they need to say it. But when it comes to the rubber meeting the road, they don't pass and sign the legislation to provide the very things that they are uh, campaigning on. Mm. And they have to have everything. I mean, Mm. (laughs) that's the thing that just, that just, that, that, that blows my mind. Mm. But that's typical of empires. That's typical of empire. Works like, always works like this. The, the, those who are the beneficiaries, Mm -hmm. They never want to share. They, in fact, on the contrary, they become predatory, not just with respect to the empires, but with respect to their own societies. Because, of course, you can't stop being a predator um, when you're back home, when you are a predator abroad. It doesn't actually work like that. It creates a kind of ruthlessness and cynicism that is inevitable. If you read British literature, by the way, 19th century, early 20th century British literature, and you read it properly, and my wife is an academic Mm -hmm. who teaches this, you can see that. 
you know, you, you mentioned predator, and and one of the and this is this is an adage that I know you've heard: a leopard doesn't change its spots. Mm-hmm. And and my wife said that to me, you know, said, well, you know, a leopard doesn't change its spots. Mm-hmm. I says, no, a leopard doesn't have to change its spots. It can just work on being a better leopard. And and that and that's the thing that the elite don't seem to get. Okay, mm-hmm. work work on being because the 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 American Empire, in my humble opinion, did not have to. It was going to it was going to decline because again, history tells us that's what empires do. But in this particular circumstance, mm-hmm. it seems as though the United States has exacerbated the decline of the American empire by its own reckless, feckless, foolish, uh, mm. a policy, it, you know, starting the war in, in, in Ukraine, poking their finger in the eye of China over Taiwan, this not recognizing Nicolas Maduro as the democratically elected president of Venezuela and and trying to place Juan Guaido in that position while the unite while Joe Biden and other American presidents traverse the world talking about being champions of democracy these kinds and 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 to what end that that you the United States winds up going hat in hand to Venezuela because it needs oil and now with the blowing up of the uh Nord Stream 2 pipeline and shutting off gas to to uh, uh, to Europe, now the EU nations are scratching their heads, saying, "Wait a minute, where's our upside here? You're making all this money selling hyper-priced gas. You're making all this money m- selling all these weapons, and we're doing this at your behest. And we're freezing, we're hungry, and you're con- you're you're cannibalizing our industry. So even its allies are starting to turn on the United States as." Winter sets in, as as my co-host Garland Nixon loves to say, as General Winter is now riding across the European tundra. Uh, they can't see the writing on the wall. Mm. Uh, they're that illiterate. That that to mm. me makes no sense. Mm. Let's look at the other side, because of course the Chinese and the Russians, and not just the Chinese and the Russians, are obviously the target of this sort of thing. You're absolutely right, by the way. The Global South has been looking at all of this, and uh, they are fully aware of what is going on, and that has affected their responses to all of these crises. You saw that at the G20, the G7, far from Russia being isolated, it Mm -hmm. was the G7 that was isolated. Lavrov is, you know, received like a sort of conquering hero. The Indonesians lay out the red carpet for him. C is the big center of attention. All the leaders want to speak to him. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the tactic? What is the strategy of the other great powers, the Russians and the Chinese? Do they try to accelerate the decline of the United States? Do they act purely reactively? Do they integrate with each other? Do they try? What what is what are they going to do in the face of this as, attack? Which is, let's face it, it, it is an attack that this experiencing. Well, I think China's uh, win win strategy is the prevailing approach and is the dominant approach and seems to be carrying the day. Um, because you look at the uh, at the African nations that have voted in the United Nations that have voted against the United States uh, sanctions regime, even in the face of uh, the uh, malign Russian act, I forget the name of the bill that that uh, the United States passed in in the in the House and in the Senate uh, to punish African nations that are operating as sovereign entities and deciding to do business based upon what is their best interest as opposed to the best interest of the United States. So you have Russia uh, uh, offering grain, you have Russia offering fuel, you have China uh, building infrastructure on, on with win-win strategies. You have um, Russia canceling debt. You have China canceling debt in contradiction to what the IMF and the World Bank uh, do. So 
their approach, I believe, I, I don't I don't think that they really see this in the matter of having to react to the United States because they see it, it's a failed strategy. They're going to let it die under its own momentum. So they don't, I think, and, and plus, I also believe that they don't really want the United States to quote unquote collapse. They understand the value of a United States economy. They understand the value of United States power. It just can no longer be unitary, unipolar, hegemonic. Uh, you've got to play with the team. You can no longer try to control the entire, not only game, but the entire league. Uh, if we want to put it in a World Cup <laughs> context, since that's where we are right now. You know, you got to work on the pitch. You can't control the whole the whole tournament. You, you know, on this, on the last point, you're absolutely, I mean, you're absolutely spot on. Because if you look at C, C, what Xi Jinping is constantly trying to say to Biden, if you listen to what Putin said at Valdai, Putin said straightforwardly, we're going to move from a unipolar to a multipolar system. But the United States is going to be a part of that multipolar system. It's not going to disappear. We're not looking for it to disappear. We expect it to play a role. A positive role in it. And that and he's still saying that in spite of all the things that they're saying about him, in mm -hmm. spite of the fact that we have this conflict in Ukraine. And if you look at what C is trying to say to Biden all the time is put aside this unipolar hegemonic thinking. We talk about win-win situations with all sorts of countries. We also are talking about the same thing with you. <laughs> we are prepared to work with you obviously you've got our, you, you've got your issues with things that happened in the past but at the end of the day we are looking forward and we're prepared to work with you going forward so the other side doesn't want to be hostile not in the way that the united states is hostile towards them and i think part of it a great part of it has to do with a different perception or understanding of the concept of time mm -hmm. when you look at china mm -hmm. their culture the thousands of years that they've been in existence when you look at uh russia the soviet union that part of europe how long th that culture has been in existence when you look at the Middle East, when you look at Iran, I can't remember who it was that said, uh, you have the watches, but we have the time. They, they have a different perspective and perception of time because their cultures have existed over a much longer arc of history. So you've got, and, 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 and President Xi, President Putin, uh, Khomeini, they all are students of their cultures and their students of history. So they sit back and look at Joe Biden and they say, look, young man, you, <laughs> in the context of the age of their countries, you know, I know Joe is older than all those guys, but they look at him and say, you know, look, look, America, tiss, tiss, kind of like my dad used to sit there reading the paper and he'd tell me what to do. And then he'd say, you know, you got to come back through this way one more time. I'm still going to be sitting here. And when you come back, you're going to have to pay the toll. Uh, that's kind of what 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 these leaders, they mm -hmm. see the world through a different lens. And unfortunately, the United States can't make the adjustment to its prescription. Mm -hmm. It's got a, a cataract or it's got a, a, a some kind of eye problem. It can't it can't see the world mm -hmm. clearly. Mm. So what is going to happen with the United States? I mean, are we going to see intensifications mm. of these interventions? Yes. And how far is the United States prepared to go? I mean, that's the big question I think a lot of people ask, because, I mean, is it prepared to, does it, does it understand that there are limits to what it can do? Or does it accept no limits at all? Mm -hmm. That's the question I always ask you when you're, mm -hmm. when you're on my show. What? Because at, I've said to you a number of times the the hegemon does not go quietly into that long dark mm -hmm. night. So what? Um, 
I don't know the answer to that question. Hmm. What I do know is that you have forces such as Tony Blinken mm. who believe the United States can win at any cost. Mm. And they appear to be the, the, the Tony Blinkens of the world, the Clintons of the world, uh, uh, you know, those that follow Brzezinski, they, mm. they, the, the, the Brzezinski mindset uh, mm. as it played out in the grand chess board and uh, mm. what, um, I can't find it. anyway. Oh, uh, Oh, between two ages, um, you know, those with there's always a, a militaristic solution in the mind of Brzezinski. The military is the is the answer. That's not going to work this time. Mm -hmm. uh, so so they seem to be misguided and believe that the mm -hmm. you know, that the United States can do what it did in World War I. It can do what it did mm -hmm. in World War II. What they fail to realize is the United States hasn't won anything since 19, since, since, uh, since the end of World War II. You know, mm -hmm. we lost in Vietnam. We lost in Afghanistan. We, we, you know, Libya, pick one. We don't win anymore mm -hmm. on the military side. So um, what, I'm, what, I, what we all pray for is that they understand uh, the whole concept of 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 a mutual annihilation that that they don't push mm. this thing to the brink and that mm. they don't force Vladimir Putin's hand they don't force uh China's hand because mm. if the United States for example sends an aircraft carrier into the South China Sea a hypersonic missile will send it to the bottom of the ocean Mm, absolutely. I mean, the, the other thing I was going to say about this is, of course, you mentioned the fact that the United States has been losing wars since the mm -hmm. Second World War. and It hasn't been at all successful. But to me, oh, we beat Panama. We beat Manuel Panama. Noriega. Right. We won Granada, <laughs> Granada and all these things. But I mean, it, it's not difficult to understand why. Because American soldiers are being sent to fight in all sorts of places that they feel no connection to. I mean, uh, Russian soldiers who are fighting in Ukraine today know why they are there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, and this is something I, I mean, these are anecdotal things, but I can, the, the statistics appear to confirm this. Russian opinion is hardening on the wall mm -hmm. because they see it as an existential issue, a defense of Russia itself and of Russians. But in fact, just really, none of the really, wars really, we've, yeah. really quickly to, to that point, the you know, it was reported in the West early on, say in February and March and April, that Vladimir Putin was facing pressure from Russians. And it was interpreted in the West as though the pressure he was facing was because he went into Ukraine. No, most of the pressure he was facing was you didn't go in early enough. You didn't go in hard enough because the, the Russian people are saying, President Putin, we should be done with this and we should have been moving on to the next issue. So I just wanted to be sure that that, that, that point, Absolutely. That point got made. Can, can I just say, I mean, we had we had a confirmation of that just a few days ago because Putin met the mothers of Russian soldiers who fought in, a, in, in Ukraine, some of whose sons have died. And he actually admitted to them that, they made a mistake. They should have recognized uh, the independence of Donbass and the fact that Donbass wanted to be incorporated in Russia a long time ago, that they, they, they were mistaken in putting it off as long as they did. And of course, that is Putin responding to real Russian opinion as mm -hmm. opposed to what people in the West imagine. And of course, this aspect that, you know, about Russian public opinion, West, Westerners have never understood that Russia does have a public opinion. It always has done. And that Russian governments, even Joseph Stalin's government, have to take that always into account. And of course, Vladimir Putin, who depends, who, you know, has to be elected, has to think about elections. He has got to be more sensitive to currents of Russian opinion than any previous Russian leader has ever been. And I, I teach uh, comparative politics at mm -hmm. uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore. And right now we're studying Russia. And 
one of the things that I'm really conscious of and want to be sure that my students understand is contrary to the Western narrative, President Putin is not insane. He is not a evil dictator uh, that Russia does have a constitution. They do have a government uh, that he he's an astute politician is is what he is and that there are incredible uh, opposing forces that he has to ba- the interests of which he has to balance and so far he's done a very good job at at balancing uh, balancing those interests and the sooner uh, my students and and others understand this the sooner Americans you know I was listening to national public radio here in the United States uh, uh, earlier in the week, and they were talking about the Ukraine um, conflict, and they said they put it in the context of the Ukraine versus Putin. And I, I said, wait a minute, no, he's he's the president of a country. He's <laughs> it's not it, it's not like he owns an NBA team, um, and, and and so you know we. This, we have to change, this narrative has to change or else the analysis that is being provided is going to be incredibly flawed. Yeah. And of course, one of the ways that it is flawed is because if you center everything on Putin, and I noticed General Wesley Clark, for example, talking about the military situation in Ukraine and saying, you know, Putin has led Ukraine into a military trap. So you know, it's Putin who's commanding all the armies. He runs the economy. He runs. He has no generals. He, runs, he has no generals, apparently. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But this idea that it's Putin all the time has given, taken this, this dangerous idea that if you get rid of Putin, somehow your problems are going to be solved. There's no understanding that, you know, behind Putin, there is this huge country, Russia, which beyond Putin has its own ideas, its own policies, its own feelings, its own, uh, uh, you know, power mm-hmm. centers, as you correctly said. And of course, it's in some ways very easy to say it's only Putin, because if you talked about Russia, then, of course, you have a completely different set of problems. But but that is a standard tactic that the United States uses. They vilify an individual because then it becomes much easier for Americans to understand. So if you look at Haiti, it's not the years of oppression that the United States and other countries like France have imposed upon Haiti. It's uh, Jimmy Barbecue Cherizier. He's the gang leader. He's the guy that we have to deal with when, in fact, he's actually the revolutionary that's working on behalf of the Haitian people. It's not the United States. It's not the United States convincing Zelensky to send troops to the border of Russia. It's Vladimir Putin is evil and demented. It's um, uh, in Libya. It was. It was Muammar Gaddafi is the problem. Mm -hmm. In Iraq, it was uh, Saddam Hussein is the problem. Never American policy, Mm -hmm. never incoherent American policy, Mm -hmm. never inconsistent, hypocritical American policy. Mm -hmm. So, and what winds up happening is we remove the individual, we create a power vacuum, and then we don't know what to do with the power vacuum. That's what's going on in Libya right now. That's what's happening in Haiti. Power vacuum. The United States assassinates um, uh, Moise in Haiti, even though he was an American puppet. Power vacuum gets created. The United States, some will say this is a uh, the idea of controlled chaos that the United States wants to wants to create the chaos so that it can continue to use that chaos as a rationale for hegemonic dominance. Others will say they just don't know what they're doing. I, I, I'm entirely of the last view, by the way. I think the <laughs> idea of controlling chaos is a contradiction in terms. Mm-hmm. You cannot control chaos. Chaos spreads. 
And like cancer. The, like cancer, absolutely. And in fact, you can see that in the Middle East and overthrowing Saddam Hussein, overthrowing uh, Gaddafi, waging a war in Syria. What is actually achieved, if you look at it, is it's leading to the collapse of American influence in the Middle East. We now have the Saudis aligning with the Russians or talking to the Russians. We have uh, um, Syria and Turkey apparently engaging in a very complex rapprochement. We have uh, uh, Egypt also tilting towards the Russians as well, distancing itself from the United States. If they wanted to create chaos in the Middle East and thought they would benefit from it, well, it's had the opposite effect. Because you have people... Colombia talking to Venezuela now. Exactly. And exactly. for years they were diametrically opposed. Exactly. Because ultimately people do not want to live in chaos. Any Correct. situation where there is an ordered government, even if it's not you know, the ideal government, is preferable to chaos. So if you're seen as an agent of chaos, it turns people against you and it doesn't make it easier for you to control them. Ab absolutely right. And what is seemingly lost on the Tony Blinkens and, and the and I keep referring to him because he's the current uh, secretary of state in, in, in Joe Biden. But it I don't want to fall into the very trap that I just talked about in terms of vilifying individuals, because what we find is. It's not Biden administration policy. It's American foreign policy because mm -hmm. Joe Biden is employing a lot of the very same policy that Donald Trump employed mm -hmm. and which uh, in terms of the, the underlying machinations and the underlying reasons for what's being done are very consistent uh, mm -hmm. uh, across administrations. But what they really don't seem to understand mm -hmm. is that a lot, and this goes back to the point that we made at the very top of the discussion, is that a lot of the action that has been taken and the policies that have been implemented by the United States are forcing alliances. Mm -hmm. That I, I wrote a piece a while ago called "The Unaligned Nations Realign," mm -hmm. and the and the point of that piece was that due to American policy, we are forcing countries to develop alliances that before we never would have thought, who would have thought that Iran would be sending oil to Venezuela? Mm -hmm. Who would have thought that you could go to Venezuela and find Iranian fully stocked grocery stores in Venezuela? Mm -hmm. All of this in response to American mm -hmm. pressure, mm -hmm. uh, an American sanctions regime that makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely. Now, I'm just going to finish and I'm going to go hand over to Alex in a moment, but I want to just finish with one thing. Now, mm -hmm. there was this G20 meeting in Bali and mm -hmm. after it happened, I saw the communiques, I got some of the original headlines. I said to myself, this is a completely <laughs> empty event. It is one of no consequence. I have radically revised my view mm -hmm. of this meeting mm -hmm. as I've gradually got a clear understanding of what happened because what happened in bali it turns out was that the western powers thought that they could try and isolate russia dominate the discussions control the agenda as they have always done up to now and what happened was that all of the other countries ganged up on them <laughs> they they closed the they isolated the g7 Mm -hmm. And you had bizarre situations where the other countries, Indonesia, Turkey, Russia, China, India, were having substantive discussions with each other, agreeing all kinds of things with each other. And the G7 were reduced to fighting over a few words in the communiques mm -hmm. and trying to organize boycotts of joint photographic sessions in which Lavrov would appear. It, it, it was actually, in my opinion, a key moment, a key dividing line, because it showed that for the first time, most of the world is saying goodbye, United States, goodbye, collective West. We are going to work and do things for ourselves. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, 
At the beginning of the summit, a lot of people looked at the fact that President Putin did not attend in person and saw that as a move of weakness. But to your point, what I think President Putin said, I don't have to go. Uh, <laughs> I can, you know, he sent a very capable, competent representative in uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. And one of the things that I think was was incredibly telling was the missile strike and the alleged, oh, Russia has sent a missile into Poland. And that forced President Biden to go into control mode and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. We do not want this rumor to take hold. We do not want, because the ramifications from this could be catastrophic. So even Joe Biden, for once, had to come clean, tell the truth, and say, I don't think that this was missile was sent by Russia uh, because the ramifications, we really don't want a nuclear conflict over foolishness like this. So yeah. I, I think I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. And when you look at those who look at the uh, the in, the exchange between uh, President Xi and uh, the prime minister of, of Canada, where um, Trudeau, where Xi had to pull Trudeau aside and say, hey, look, uh, you know, don't play me like this. I, I'm I'm a little smarter than you think I am. Uh, and that takes me back to Tony Blinken with the Chinese delegation in, in Anchorage when the Chinese had to tell Tony Blinken, look, son, uh, we're not those folks. We're not going to sit here and let you insult us like this. The game is changing. And folks that were incredibly diplomatic are now becoming less diplomatic and more aggressive and very clear. And uh, the United States is, is losing the argument. Yeah, right. I think I think this is the point where I, I hand over to Alex because we've been uh, waiting patiently. And so, I and I Alex, can give you a little more time if you need if you need some more time. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions for you, Wilmer. So let's just uh, get uh -oh. started. Yeah, let's just get started <laughs> and uh, and get through. My standard answer questions. is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let me uh, throw the first Ask one Alex. at you. I think mm -hmm. I, I think you'll handle this one uh, just fine from Tyler. The great powers divided the world by ideologies in the Cold War, but now one side has yo no unifying ideology like it had in communism. How can you, the minds of the people, if you have no ideology? Whoa. Well, I, I, I take a little issue with the premise. I, don't, I, I think that the ideology conflict was more of a pretext than a reality. I think the United States, for example, used the so-called threat of communism as an excuse for interventionalism and hegemony. I think the issues were more economic, and I think the issues had more to do with, with access to, to limited resources than uh, and, and, and maintaining an economic order uh, as opposed to uh, a, um, a, a, an, ideo an ideological conflict. And I am not that well versed in Russian history, but I, I do know that when you went from uh, President Gorbachev to uh, uh, who, who replaced Gorbachev? Yeltsin. Yeltsin. Yeltsin, thank you. Yeah. That, um, you know, that to me was more of an economic problem and that uh, Gorbachev was trying to open to the West but not allow management and control of Western financial interests to come in and take over the Russian economy. And Yeltsin was more amenable to Western influence of the financial nature. Now that's very simplistic, I understand. And I said up front, I don't know a lot. I'm not that well versed in Russian history. But so the, the whole ideological conflict, I don't believe was really the basis of the differences. I think those were very simplistic 
easy things for uh, hegemons to use as they were trying to position themselves economically and position themselves from a resource access perspective. Right. And, and Stephen says, look at how the United States started freedom from the global hegemon. You don't need an ideology. Uh, I, well, uh, well, w that that I think would would be a, two things. One, that would be a discussion for another an entire show. And two, I, I would defer to uh, PhDs in philosophy then <laughs> I'm a political scientist. I'll, I'd, I'd leave that to, to those that have studied uh, 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 a, a different area. Right. Nick says, Putin has mentioned that there are people and parties in the West who have similar values to Putin. Is it likely mm -hmm. that these parties will be able to gain support in the West? Are there parties, are there people in the United States who uh, you believe have can find similarities with with Russia, with with these these new powers, oh, absolutely. Uh, because when you read the Valdai speech, when you know he he's talking about opportunity for all. He's talking about equal distribution of resources. He's talking about uh, no uni unitary hegemonic control. He's talking about cooperation. When you look at what uh, China is doing in terms of the countries it's going into, the deals that it's cutting. Again, it's win-win it's strategy. Um, it's about economic development. It's about providing uh, infrastructure so that everybody can, be can benefit. Uh, one of the things that China did in Indonesia was, didn't they just open up a um, high-speed rail system in, in Indonesia mm -hmm. that is going to connect with the other high-speed rail systems that China has been building so that the world can benefit. So I, I think as soon as you're able to move your mind beyond Vladimir Putin is evil, Vladimir Putin is crazy, and you really start reading what the man is saying and looking at what Russia is doing and looking at what China is doing, juxtaposed to what the United States says, and then look at what the United States does. There are all mm -hmm. kinds of people in the world that, that, that are on the same mindset as, as President Putin and President Xi and, and many others. And Sanjeva and, and, says- and, and Maduro and, and, you know. Right. And Sanjeva says, thanks for warning against drawing analogies from recent conflicts, especially World War II to this Ukraine war. World War II was only one conflict in millennia of human conflict. To draw accurate parallels, one needs to study a whole of conflicts, not just mm -hmm. ones that Hollywood loves. And I, I think that's I think that's very true. Uh, and and that the the base I think the basis of the current conflicts is changing, which is what uh, G and in and, and Putin and Maduro and and uh, Khomeini they're all saying is is that the old mindset is no longer applicable, that peaceful coexistence is the thought of the day, not hegemonic dominance, and that we can all get along, we can all do well and do good at the same time. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting comment for you. Dr. Wilmer, U.S. has been screwing up Haiti since Woodrow Wilson. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <coughs> well, even before Woodrow Wilson. Um, uh, no, but that's 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 absolutely that's absolutely correct. Uh, and I was really speaking of it, of course, in the current context, uh, because we've only got a limited amount of time for the program. But no, there is a long interventionist history going back to Dessalines and going back to Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is a, a long, long history and uh, people really need to spend some time in understanding and studying not only the history of Haiti, but understanding the geopolitical position of the island and why the United States 
wants sees Haiti as being so valuable. The United States wants to build a naval base off one of the small islands of Haiti in anticipation of China wanting to use uh, the Pacific to come in and attack the United States. That's also why Guantanamo Bay is so important in Cuba, is so important uh, to the United States. Um, so no, the, the, absolutely right. That, that point is absolutely right. All right, from Matlas X, what is Dr. Leon's opinion of UN Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield's recent visit to Africa, where she seemed to have a condescending tone and throwing around ultimatums? Disgusting and insulting. Disgusting and insulting is, I, you said it. I, you're absolutely right. Uh, but also understand uh, that that she is a functionary of the United States government. And so she's she seems to be ignorant of history. Uh, she seems to be ignorant of an understanding of diplomacy. She seems to be an imperialist who thinks that she can go to uh, African leaders and tell them what they need to do. Uh, and it's unfortunate that she is the U.S. what UN uh, amb the United States ambassador to the United Nations. She has no tact. She has no style. She's not a she's not a Sergey Lavrov, and well, not many people are. But um, uh, let's move on. I, I think I've spent enough time yeah. talk, talking about her. <laughs> From David, does Wilmer see Biden shaking up his cabinet? Not any way that would bring about a substantive change in a substantial change in policy. Uh, he might just rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic, but the ship is still going to sink. Hmm. From Matlas, what would happen if AMLO in Mexico shifted to Russia, China? Would that mean that the U.S. would need to bring freedom and democracy to them? <laughs> hmm. uh, at the barrel of a gun. But it's but it's interesting. It's interesting that AMLO co-wrote the uh, declaration to have military intervention in Haiti. Right. So and and and, and that has bothered a lot of Haitians. Um, understanding that Mexico is one of the transit points that Haitians are using to get into the United States. So AMLO has a uh, immigrant issue uh, that, that he needs uh, to help solve, but siding with the United States on backing a military intervention in Haiti is definitely the wrong answer. Hmm. Do you have time for a couple more? Yeah, sure. Uh, Wilmer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Got about another 15 minutes, I think. Okay, I awesome. Know. Awesome. Sure. Uh, Raphael says, Frederick Douglass, as U.S. ambassador in Haiti, was screaming and yelling at mm -hmm. the U.S. government to stop destroying Haiti. And that was before Woodrow Wilson. That's what, that's what I'm saying, is that there is a long, long, long history of United States intervention in the island. Uh, the United States, that, of course, was the first and, and only successful slave revolt. And the United States and France have never, and other countries in Europe, have never forgiven and never will forgive Haiti for that. Because the one thing that hegemons cannot tolerate is successful opposition. And so they want to be sure that it is always understood you can revolt if you want to, but there will be hell to pay. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question on Ukraine. Uh, Alexander, are you with us? Yes, absolutely. Okay, Sorry, okay, I, 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 I'm okay, yeah. yeah, you are. Okay. What, what's life's purpose? Ask, what incentive does a Ukrainian politician have to settle for peace when pumped with $100 billion in aid, government expenses all paid by the U.S. and a media narrative in favor of Ukraine? War is I, so profitable. I, I'm afraid that is absolutely correct. And I'm afraid also that that points... Uh, the ultimate responsibility for this war, because this war, be absolutely under no doubt about this, this war is destroying Ukraine. It is destroying Ukraine as a society, as a country, as a state, not something, by the way, that the Russians wanted to do. The Russians wanted a negotiated settlement in Ukraine. They've been trying to achieve it for years, even at the start of this military intervention. At the beginning of this year, their objective was to was to negotiate 
a settlement of the overall conflict in Ukraine with Ukraine. What has happened is we in the West, and of course the United States has been the major player, but Britain has played a big role, and so has the European Union. We've gone in, we've offered the Ukrainians money, we've offered them weapons, we've given them all kinds of assurances, we've told them don't negotiate. We are going to help you to achieve victory. We're going to give you all the money you want, all the weapons you want. And we have led Ukraine to its destruction. And in the meantime, and along the way, of course, there are some people in Ukraine who benefit hugely materially from this process. And of course, there's other people in Ukraine who perhaps are not benefiting from the process in the same way, but who have been immensely empowered by it. And there are people who have ideological views, which, of course, are deeply disturbing. I'm being careful what I say, because, of course, we're partly on YouTube. Deeply disturbing ideological views, which are ideological views, which we in the West always pretend we oppose. Absolutely. And and all the aid in the world isn't going to heat your home when winter comes and your uh, and your electrical power has been knocked out. Um, it, it, well said, Alexander. I don't need to add anything to that. Yeah. From Commando Crossfire, Haiti was a state born out of rebellion against their, their slavers. Thus, it has always been a target. Can't have slaves thinking they could change mm-hmm. their condition. Mm-hmm. Ab- absolutely right. A- and, and that applies to, to vassals as well as... Uh, Macron is in is in the United States today. There's going to be a state dinner. He's here begging uh, Joe Biden to allow France to change their condition. Germany is finding itself in the same circumstance. Italy is finding itself in the same circumstance. So whether you're slaves or whether whether you're vassals, um, the circumstance at the end of the day is still the same. Right. James says, are the Chinese lockdowns some kind of economic tactic to protect China? Hmm. I, I don't I don't think so. Uh, that's not a particular area. Uh, you, you might want to talk to KJ No or talk to George Koo to get a better understanding of that than, than myself. But I think that this is a response to COVID. And uh, and and China is saying, in fact, I was listening to a story about this yesterday on NPR and they were saying about how crazy China is and look at the impact that this is having on China's economy. And China's saying economic issues are short term issues. COVID issues are longer term issues. And the sooner we can get COVID under control, the better we can focus on our economy and get our economy back on track. So I don't I don't think. I think that this is a, a COVID response. And Raphael says, Putin knows one thing for sure. NATO, the U.S., does not have the guts and do not want to fight Russia and his and his existing coalition. Not only does NATO not have the guts, NATO doesn't have the army. So, so I mean, what are they going to do? What are they, what are they going to use? I mean... What I understand is what President Putin, Russia is about to send close to three. Is it three hundred thousand troops Probably across more. across the border? Come on now. Uh, um, who was it that said Russia's going to run out of Ukrainian targets before they run out of missiles? Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter said <laughs> Russia will run out of targets before they run out of missiles. Yeah. Uh, Let's do a couple more and we'll wrap it up. We're coming at about the 15 minute mark. Uh, Your opinion of the work of Grover Fur? I'm I'm not sure. I don't know who that is. I have no clue. You got me on that one. I'll have to look it up. I'm not sure, Jungle Jin, who that is, but thank you for for that question. And as you can see behind me, I'm 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 fairly well read, but Grover Fur, you you got me on that one. Yeah. Um, if you put it in the in the chat, maybe uh, Jungle Jin, we could you could help us understand who that is. Uh, Sparky says someone mentioned the other day the U.S. doesn't do diplomacy. Yes, they do. They do gunboat diplomacy. Uh, very well said. 
And uh, and again, you send that gunboat into the South China Sea, a hypersonic missile will send it to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Um, and I had another another one or two here. One from Sanjeva. One sec. Uh, here we go. Sanjeva says, I wonder if people who become top managers or politicians have to have sociopathic tendencies to succeed. No. Uh, if, if so, then we would all just throw in the towel and, and give up the game. Um, no, I, I don't, I don't believe that in any way, shape or form. I believe that, that those without those tendencies have a tougher road to hoe, but no, again, otherwise we'd have to give up hope and just, and just all go play golf. Hmm. And a final question and we will wrap it up. And this is a good one. Wilmer, what's your opinion on Ethiopia? Well, it, that's kind of a very broad question. In in what context? Uh, but it seems as though uh, a peace agreement uh, is being has been reached in in the region. Hopefully, the United States will have learned some lesson and stop funding and fomenting conflict uh, in the region, so that the so that the Ethiopians and the uh, and the, and and the others in the region can get back to uh, cooperative, peaceful coexistence, and they can all thrive. Unfortunately, that does not seem to be uh, the American tactic. All right. And from Jungle Jing, Grover first spent his career debunking lies about oh. the USSR, Stalin, especially what he considers to be the lies of Khrushchev's denunciation. Okay. okay. Thank you for that, Jungle Jin. And finally, Sparky says, Democrat hero Woodrow Wilson's Militant racism played a part in his decision to invade Haiti on the behalf of the New York Bank to keep down Haitian wages. Oh, and that's a, and that's a, that's still a current problem because the Haitian labor issue is one of the main reasons why the United States is trying to control the island because Haitians in the sweatshops that industries have built in Haiti they make less than five dollars a day, when a gallon of gas in Haiti is almost six dollars a gallon. So there are a number of reasons why the West is is and and also they perceive a a beginning of a failing of China production and they're looking at Haiti as one of the places to start increase produ low wage production to offset China. So that was true in Woodrow Wilson's day and it's true in our day as well. Fantastic. And uh, let's wrap it up with Zach saying it's like America is spending the night out getting completely hammered. And as they make their way through town, they're pissing off friends and enemies by running into their cars yeah. and running over their children in crosswalks. Th th thank you. Yeah, Zach from Rockfin. Thank you for that. <laughs> fantastic way to uh, to end this fantastic show. Alexander, you are. Well, I think me, he's... But let's bring Alexander no. back. Let's thank uh, I Dr. Think Wilmer Leon. Thank you very much. Oh. I will have all your information in the description box down below. And as a pinned comment, thank you to our moderators, Valies Zarael, Alan Watson, Reckless Abandon. Um, thank you to everyone that was watching us on uh, Rockfin, Odyssey, Rumble, thedurant.locals.com and YouTube. Alexander, you want to say something? I and, just wanted to will pass it on I don't to Dr. Say, Willem, 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 I don't want to say thank we'll you. I just wanted to say thank you to, to Wilma for coming on our program. I think we've it's been incredibly instructive and very interesting and wonderful. And I must say, I mean, I thought the metaphor at the end of the car, you know, the American <laughs> drivers smashing everybody else's cars, running over their children. Well, all you have to do is to look at what European politicians are now saying. I mean, even the most ardent pro-American ones, you know, the Green Party leaders in Germany, the uh, Macron, they're all pissed off <laughs> with the United States and they're complaining about it. I mean, I find it risable that they're doing it now. I mean, you know, this is totally predictable and it shows how, you know, blind they were to the realities. But the fact is, if even these people are becoming angry with the United States, think how others around the world must feel. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the protests in the streets in Germany, in the streets in France, in the streets in London, it's not being it's not being covered to any great degree here by Western media. But 
people are cold, people are hungry, and the factories are closing. Mm -hmm. And the United States is the primary reason why. American policy. And and folks aren't pleased. And let me say, I, I mentioned the Mickey Matt. That was Ray McGovern's uh, construct that he developed. I got to be sure I give the proper uh, credit and shout out to Ray McGovern. All right. Props to Ray McGovern. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Thank you so, so much for a fantastic My live honor. stream. My honor. Our, ple- you, our, our honor and pleasure, uh, Wilmer. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Thank you everybody for uh, catching us on this live stream. Take care and have a great day.